Chapter 27, The Gosling from the Wild Robot. Something was happening inside the goose egg. Tap, 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 crunch. A tiny bill poked through the eggshell, peeped once, and then continued crunching away. The hole grew bigger and bigger, and then, like a robot breaking from a crate, the hatchling pulled himself out into the world. He lay quietly in his nest with his eyes closed, surrounded by chips of broken shell. And when his eyes slowly winked open, the very first thing he saw was the robot looking back. Mama, mama, peeped the gosling. I am not your mother, said the robot. Mama, mama, I am not your mother. Food, food, the gosling was hungry. Of course he was. So, using her friendliest voice, Roz said, What would you like to eat, little darling? Food, was the only response. The hatchling was far too young to be helpful. Roz needed to find a grown goose. So, she scooped up the nest with the gosling inside, placed it on her flat shoulder, and marched through the forest, searching for geese. Chapter 28, The Old Goose Ordinarily, the forest animals would have run from, run away from the monster. But they were awfully curious why she was carrying a hatchling on her shoulder. And once Roz explained the situation, the animals actually tried to help. A frog pointed Roz up to the squirrels. A squirrel recommended that she speak with the magpies. And then a magpie set them over to the beaver pond. The ground grew soggier, the grass grew taller, and soon the robot and gosling were looking across a wide, murky pond. Dragonflies buzzed through the reeds. Turtles sunned themselves on a log. Schools of small fish gathered in the shadows. And there, floating in the center of the pond, was an old gray goose. A very good morning to you, the robot's friendly voice boomed over the water. I have an adorable little gosling with me. The goose just stared. I am in great need of your assistance, said Roz. Actually, the gosling is in need of your assistance. The goose didn't move. Food, peeped the gosling. Food, food. The tiny little voice was more than the old goose could bear, and she began gliding across the pond and squawking to the robot. What are you doing with that hungry hatchling? Where are his parents? There was a terrible accident, said Roz. It was my fault. This gosling is the only survivor. If there was a terrible accident, why does your voice sound so cheerful? The goose flapped her wings. Are you sure you didn't eat his parents? I am sure I didn't eat his parents, said Roz, returning to her normal voice. I do not eat anything, including parents. The goose squinted at the robot. Then she said, Do you know who his parents were? I do not know. Well, they must have belonged to one of the other flocks on the island because nobody in my flock is missing. Will you take the gosling? I most certainly will not, squawked the goose. I can't take in every orphan I see. You say this is your fault. It seems to me that it's up to you to make things right. Mama, mama, peeped the gosling. I have tried to tell him that I am not his mother, said the robot, but he does not understand. Well, you'll have to act like his mother if you want him to survive. There was that word again, act. Very slowly, the robot was learning to act friendly. Maybe she could learn to act like a mother as well. You do want him to survive, don't you, said the goose. Yes, I want him to survive, said the robot, but I do not know how to act like a mother. Oh, it's nothing. You just have to provide the gosling with food and water and shelter. Make him feel loved, but don't pamper him too much. Keep him away from danger and make sure he learns to walk and talk and swim and fly and get along with others and look after himself. And that's really all there is to motherhood. The robot just stared. Mama! Food! said the gosling. 
Now would probably be a good time to feed your son, said the goose. Yes, of course, said the robot. What should I feed him? Give him some mashed up grass. Add in a few insects. If And if a few insects get in there, all the better. Roz tore several blades of grass from the ground. She mashed them into a ball and then dropped the ball into the nest. The gosling shook his tail feathers and chewed his very first bites of food. By the way, my name is Ludwing, said the goose. Everyone already knows your name, Roz, but what's the gosling's name? I do not know, the robot looked at her adopted son. What is your name, gosling? He can't name himself, squawked Ludwing. And then, with a loud burst of wing beats, the goose fluttered up the pond and landed right on Roz's head. Water streamed down the robot's dusty body as Ludwing leaned over the nest. Oh dear, he certainly is a tiny thing, said Ludwing. He must be a runt. I'll warn you, Roz, runts don't usually last very long. And with you for a mother, it'll take a miracle for him to survive. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. However, the gosling still deserves a name. Let's see here. His bill is an unusually bright color. It's actually quite lovely. If I were his mother, I'd call him Bright Bill. But you're his mother, so it's up to you. His name will be Bright Bill, said Roz, as the goose fluttered back to the water, and we will live by this pond where he can be around other geese. I will find a sturdy tree nearby. You will do no such thing. The goose flapped her wings. A tree is no place for a gosling. Bright Bill needs to live on the ground like a normal goose. Ludwig seized up, sized up the robot. I suppose you two will need a rather large home. You better speak with Mr. Beaver. He can build anything. He's a little gruff at times, but if you're extra friendly, I'm sure he'll help you out. And if he gives you trouble, remind him that he owes me a favor. Chapter 29, The Beavers Every day the beavers swam along their dam, inspecting and repairing it. The wall of wood and mud allowed only a trickle of water to pass through, and it had turned a narrow stream into the wide pond that many animals now called home. As Roz and Brightbill walked around the pond, they passed hundreds of chewed-up tree stumps, proof that the beavers needed a constant supply of wood. And this gave Roz an idea. Excuse me. The robot swung her flattened hand, and the sounds of chopping wood echoed across the water. They were soon replaced by the sounds of footsteps and shaking leaves as the robot carefully walked along the beaver dam with a gosling on her shoulder and a freshly cut tree in her hands. The beavers floated beside their lodge and stared at the bizarre sight with open mouths until Mr. Beaver slapped his broad tail in the water, which meant stop right there. The robot stopped. Hello, beavers. My name is Roz, and this is Brightbill. Please do not be frightened. I am not dangerous. She held out the tree. I have brought you a gift. I thought perhaps you could use this in your beautiful dam. No, thanks, said Mr. Beaver. I have a strict policy never to accept gifts from Mons... Don't be ridiculous, interrupted Mrs. Beaver. We can't let a perfectly good birch go to waste. I'm afraid I must insist, said Mr. Beaver. Mrs. Beaver turned to her husband. Remember how you asked me to point out when you're being stubborn and rude? Well, you're being stubborn and rude. Then she turned back to Roz. Thank you, monster. If you'd be so kind as to drop the tree in the water, we'll take it from there. I am not a monster, Roz tossed the tree like a twig. I am a robot. The tree smacked against the water and sent the beavers bobbing up and down. Just then, Brightbill started peeping. Mama, hungry! So Roz dropped a ball of grass into the nest. The gosling thinks you're his mother, came a quiet voice. It was Paddler, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver's son. His real mother is dead, said Roz, so I have adopted him. There was a brief silence, then Paddler looked up at Roz and said, You're a very good robot to take care of Bright Bill. Mr. Beaver sighed, Yes, yes, that's very good of you, Roz, but I don't understand 
what any of this has to do with us. My son and I need a home, and Ludwig said you would help us build one. Of course she did, Mr. Beaver muttered to himself. Ludwig gets me out of one lousy jam, and I spend the rest of my days doing her favors. Mrs. Beaver glared at her husband. Sorry, he said, realizing he was being stubborn and rude again. Stay right there, Roz. We need to have a family meeting. The three beavers slipped under the water, and a moment later, their muffled voices could be heard inside the lodge. The robot stood on the dam and patiently waited with her son. Mama, Mama! Yes, Brightville, I'm trying to act like a good mother. A ripple and Mr. Beaver's head appeared above the water. If you bring us four more trees, good, healthy ones, maybe I'll have time to help you and the gosling. That is wonderful, said the robot. We will be right back. Chapter 30, The Nest I've built my fair share of lodges over the years, Mr. Beaver stood at the water's edge, but I can't say I've ever built one for a robot and a gosling. So just what exactly do you need? We need a lodge big enough for us both, said Roz. It should be comfortable and safe, and it should be near the pond. How do you, how long do you plan on living in this lodge? I do not know. Then we'd better make sure it's strong and sturdy. Mr. Beaver stroked his whiskers as he thought. Do you plan on having friends over? The missus here loves to entertain guests. I, I do not have any friends. No friends? Well, you seem pretty likable for a monster. I mean a robot. But if you want my advice, you should grow yourself a garden. Your neighbors won't be able to resist fresh herbs and berries and flowers. Just you wait and see. So we'll make sure there's a place for a garden, and we'll give your lodge some extra space for all the friends you'll be hosting. The beaver winked. We'll also need to find a way to keep your lodge comfortable when it's cold outside. Our lodge is heated by our own bodies, but I think we'll have to find another way to heat yours. The beaver and the robot thought about heat for a while. The first thing that came to Roz's mind was the sun, but then she remembered the hot spark she had felt when sliding down the mountain peak. I could heat our lodge with fire, she said. Mr. Beaver blinked his eyes. I will need to experiment, Roz continued, but I think there is a way. You go right ahead, Roz, said the beaver, but I... But, but would you try not to burn down the entire forest? Do not worry, I will be careful. Let's move on, Mr. Beaver sighed. The next order of business is to find a site for your lodge. That meadow across the water would be perfect, but the hares will have a fit if we try to build there. I think we should clear out some trees and build right in the forest, and I know just the place. The beaver took them along the water and up to a dense section of forest that jutted into the pond. It needs some work, said Mr. Beaver, trudging through the thick weeds, but this ought to do the job. Yes, this ought to do the job, said Roz in her friendliest voice. Job, said Bright Bill. Mr. Beaver was incredibly skilled at taking down trees, but even he couldn't keep up with Roz's powerful chopping hands. So he let the robot do the hard work. He pointed out... Sorry again. <laughs> He pointed out the trees and the shrubs that needed to go, and Roz started hacking away. By sunset, they were standing in a newly cleared site, and they had more than enough wood to build the lodge. You did some fine work today, Roz, Mr. Beaver yawned. I'll return in the morning, and we'll pick up right where we left off. What would you like me to do, said the robot. Tonight? So you still feel like working, do you? Very good. Well, you can start by digging out these tree stumps, and you can collect all those large flat stones over there, and you can smooth down this patch of dirt so we have a level place to build. That should keep you busy. The next morning, Mr. Beaver returned to find that Roz had been very busy indeed. All the tree stumps had been dug up, and their holes filled in with dirt. Twenty large stones had been stacked, and the ground was now perfectly level. But what astonished Mr. Beaver most was that Roz and Brightbill were huddled around a small crackling campfire. Mr. Beaver moved his lips, but no word came out. Brightbill was cold last night, said Roz, so I taught myself how to make a fire. But, but how? 
I discovered that when I strike these two stones together, they create sparks like this. I directed sparks onto dry leaves and wood until they ignited. Once I had a fire, it was easy to keep it going, and if I need to put it out, I can just add water. Mr. Beaver sat and warmed his paws. I've never seen a fire in such a neat little bundle. He stared into the flames. I've only seen it blazing through the forest, burning everything in its path, but this is so marvelous. He took another minute to enjoy the warmth. Then he and the robot got back to work. Mr. Beaver asked Roz to dig a trench here, to place large stones there, to arrange logs this way, to smear mud that way. Birds and squirrels perched in the trees and watched the new lodge take shape. It resembled the beaver lodge, but it was larger, a great dome of wood and mud and leaves. A simple opening in the wall served as the entrance, and the door was nothing more than a heavy stone that the robot could slide out of the way. Inside the lodge was one big round room. The arched ceiling was high enough that Roz could stand upright. A fire pit was set in the center of the floor, and a mesh of thin branches above acted as a vent. Long stones linked the interior walls, lined the interior walls like benches, and were covered with thick cushions of moss. There was even a hole for storing food and water for Brightbill. You've got yourself a beautiful pond view property, said Mr. Beaver. What are you going to name it? I do not understand why a beautiful lodge like this deserves a name. We call our lodge Streamcatcher. The robot's computer brain didn't take long. The lodge is for Brightbill. Brightbill is a bird. Birds live in nests. Could we call this lodge the nest? Huzzah! squeaked the beaver. The nest is a fine name for your lodge. Nest! Nest! laughed Bright Bill. They stood outside the nest and admired their handiwork until Mr. Beaver's belly began to grumble. That sound means it's time to go get dinner. Thank you very much for your help, said Roz. We could not have done this without you. You're quite welcome, said Mr. Beaver, smiling. For your garden, you'll want to speak with Tawny, the doe who lives, lie, lives over the hill. She'll know just what to do. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have to hurry home before Paddler eats all the best leaves. Enjoy your first night in the nest. And our next chapter is 31, The First Night. See you next time.